you know, over here, um, once again, you know, which, which you can see that your beculum is really nice. It comes all the way through. Over here, there's this whole density over here. This, once again, is a, um, you know, calcaneal fracture. And um, not all calcaneal fractures are equal. Here, you see this nice lucency going through over here. That's potentially very, very unstable fracture. Any, any calcaneal fractures, I'd probably be getting a CAT scan on to really get a better view of it. But this is what can happen. It's called a tongue type um, calcaneal fracture. And it can actually go through the skin. You can see it's now you know, um, caused an open fracture. And this guy's going to have permanent disability. So just important to take a look at. OK, you make sure when you examine the patient, you do, do a squeeze cupping of the calcaneus. When you, it's a very quick exam of the foot to make sure you know, that you, you don't need to get special calcaneus views. Um, and then once there's a calcaneal injury, you know it's a major force. So you've got to look elsewhere, look at the spine, um, and make sure you're not missing other fractures. Look at the other calcaneus, you know, because this is a sign of major force. Generally, you know, you see these patients who jump out of a, the fifth story window and the cops come in. And I always want to ask them, you know, if you had to do this over again, would you don't do this? Because don't you think it'd be better just to serve like a couple of years in jail, you know, and, and be able to walk normally? Um, <laughs> You know, a little time out here. Of course, didn't have. It's, I know it's hard to have presence of mind when the cops are knocking on the door. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, I, I do know. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, okay, 45-year-old limping, notes pain with walking for weeks. Okay, so this has been going on for a long time. Doesn't remember anything. This was a case where the patient, you know, was, you know, being discharged from the ER, you know, drunk with a million visits, you know, say, well, oh, maybe we should get an x-ray. Um, I think you can even see this on this. There's this ver vertical opacity here, which is very typical of a stress fracture. So when you see that, think about that. You know, it's, uh, so this patient really needs to be, uh, and, and the trabeculum, once again, this is uh, perpendicular to the trabeculum. It's a classic for a, um, uh, for a stress fracture. Okay, so knee dislocation, I mentioned, that's, I think, the biggest thing you have to worry about when you're looking at the knee, which comes in very swollen. Um, because, like I said, the arterial injury is just as much, even if they spontaneously reduced, um, they occasionally won't have swelling if the capsule is disrupted and the blood is leaked out. But generally, and, and you know, they've gotten their PCL, their ACL, their MCL, so there would theoretically be complete laxity of the knee. Um, but with all the swelling, it's going to really be hard to see that. There are a couple of things that you may notice on the exam. When you lift the leg by the heel, the knee may buckle, and there may be hyperextension compared to the other side. We're, I'll show you a picture of this. Um, and the one other thing to remember is that we, you know, generally, this is a high velocity injury. However, in an obese patient, the most minimal mechanism can cause this. Just stepping off the curb, they can dislocate their knee. Um, and so think about that, the patient is obese. You may really be a lot, of, you know, really want to be more suspicious in those patients. You know, and this just shows, you know, stepping off a curb, stepping off a stair, or simply falling while walking in the obese patient, ultra low velocity can cause this major, major problem. So this is tibial sag, you know, where, you know, they're lifting up the knee. This patient also had to get fasciotomies for compartment syndrome. But this is, you know, illustrates this. There's sag of the calf relative to the thigh. This is just indicative of bicruciate um, ligament disruption. Um, you know, this is not a hard diagnosis to make when it's actually dislocated, but when it's spontaneously reduced. You know, or if they have hard signs, if they don't have a pulse, um, if the leg is cold, this is not a hard diagnosis to make. The challenge is the one where they don't have hard findings, they spontaneously reduced, where you suspect it, you, they have, maybe they have soft signs, no, or no hard signs, but soft signs, numbness, tingling. You know, the approach is, if it's, you know, you're going to immediately get them, reduce them. If it's dislocated, obviously, you're going to search for hard signs. If you have hard signs, they're going to go to the operating room. Though probably they're going to want to get a CTA to know exactly where the injury is. Um, and if, they're, if they have soft signs, then everyone previously would get a CTA. Nowadays, you can go ankle brachial index has a very, very high sensitivity. It may miss 
you know, um, these little flap injuries, but they're not shown to be that important. So the ABI, which is a bedside test you can do, you know, with blood pressure cuff and a Doppler is, you know, a good way to go. Um, just have a high index suspicion. If they felt a pop in their knee and a lot of swelling, I would really want to do a va good vascular exam on them. You know, and the clock is ticking. And remember that obese patients are a much increased um, chance. In terms of displaced fractures, we went over this. You want to reduce those. There's going to be a lot of edema they can push through the skin. Um, Achilles tendon rupture. Big thing about Achilles tendon is a lot of, you may have an ankle ordered for you before you see the patient. So it's important to establish that their pain is posterior, not over the medial or lateral malleolus. Because if you go down that route which someone else has already started, you can miss this injury. Um, the important thing, you know, the Thompson test is 100%, almost 100% sensitive. But just remember, if they're able to plant our flex, that should not dissuade you from the diagnosis because all the, you know, you've knocked out your um, gastrox, you've knocked out your soleus with your Achilles tendon, but you still have your flexor, um, your flexors going to the toes, to the big toe, and to the, uh, the tibialis posterior. All those things are still intact, and because of physics, because they're posterior to the um, ankle, they will allow you to still plant our flex. So the fact that they still are able to plant our flex should not dissuade you if they have a positive Thompson test. Okay, just remember that anatomic lesson there. Okay, in terms of ankle. Remember, what was the last line on that slide? Oh. Oh, I forgot all about that. Thanks. Um, I was actually surprised to see this. Uh, that, you know, we, we all know fluoroquinolones um, increase the chance of having tendinopathies and t tendon ruptures. I think it increases your chance of having Achilles tendon rupture four times. But what was amazing is I didn't see the actual source, but they said that. If you do Motrin with fluoroquinolones, that it greatly increases your chance of having a tendinopathy. Like, it was huge, right, 46 times. So, you know, maybe you don't want to give Motrin if you're also putting them on, on a fluoroquinolone. You know, I don't know if you just give them Motrin, well, how much that increases your chance. But they seem to say the combination of the two was very bad. Okay, and then in terms of the ankle, um, remember, your ankle exam should really start at the, pro at the proximal fibula. Um, if it's displaced, it needs to be reduced. Um, if there, you know, if you have a, a tenderness, if you have a lateral fracture, or medial swelling, make sure you get an X-ray to make to sure that the, the mortis is not disrupted. And this is, I never look at classification systems, but this is actually fairly helpful here when you're looking at this. You know, it's really a question of whether the mortis is stable or unstable. And with a Weber A, it's below the mortis. Like you could have an avulsion fracture, I talked about there with the anterior tail of fibular. Um, you have a little pull-off fracture. That's really treated like a, a sprain. Here you have you know, a more proximal injury, but it's not at the level of the mortis. So the, it, so the mortis is not, je the, the stability is not in jeopardy. It's really when you get up to a, a B where it's at the level of the mortis, where now everything can shift over. And if it's shifted over, you, need the, you know they're gonna need to go to the operating room. And if it's not shifted over, they need to be stressed. Because if it does move, then they are not need to be put in a long leg cast rather than a short leg, and they may need operative intervention. And then a, you know, Weber C, you know, is all the way up here, more proximal fibula above the joint. That is definitely going to the OR. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, the most common injury, I always thought the most common injury was lateral. I mean, it, by inversion injuries are just so common. Every ankle I see is lateral, though some studies said that it may not be true. Um, you know, isolated lateral malleolar fractures, you know, it's not a big deal. You can put them in, I generally would put them in a posterior slip, but you could put them in a walking boot. Um, here, this is a classic case. You have a um, fracture of the distal fibula, but also you have opening of the mortise. So you really, this should be even all the way around and it's pushed over. That is, what is the, what's the name of that, by the way? I'm telling you, let's say he has no other fractures. He just has that distal fibula. What do you call that? Okay, I know I'm running out of time. This is a bimal equivalent. Okay, so you know a bimal would be if you had a fracture here of the uh, tibia, you know, um, and a trimal is where there's also posterior. But once you have disruption of a ligament, then it adds on. So uh, you know, if, uh, it becomes a bimal equivalent. If it, you know, and so just in terms of nomenclature, it's important to know that. But really, more important is just to look at make sure there's no disruption of the mortise.
Okay. Um, Alan, you know, I, I did spend my first um, year and a half medical school in France. So I am able to pronounce the French Maison Neuve. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, no, and actually, Alan Coe you know, sent me a fantastic video <laughs> uh, showing uh, <laughs> this French British rivalry. But so uh, I, I actually had wanted to ask him a question in French, but since he's not here, I can't really demonstrate my proficiency in French. Um, so, you know, if you have a medial malfracture, it's important that you uh, check for this Maison Neuve. You know, just check proximally and make sure they don't have a fibula head. So it's always important. You know, and then I didn't even know there's, there's, there's another thing, a variation on that. It's the same fracture, but it's more, uh, it's actually more distal, so on the fibula. So just important, when you, see, when you see a medial malfracture, it's an indication of a lot of force. Check the whole knee. They, make sure you check the syndesmosis, you know, do a squeeze there, and check the, you know, the proximal fib as well as, a, and get an x-ray extending up all the way up to the knee. Okay, I, every, I've seen this a million times. Everyone thinks this is an ankle fracture. It's actually a subtalar dislocation. Um, these are just fantastic to reduce. Um, and it's important that you do it quick because you know it is pressing on the skin. And this is how you do it. We've done this a bunch of times in the ER. You do it quick before you know, ortho comes down and you can get the, you know, doing it. But it's important that you have your um, assistant holding the knee you know, in a flex position, that relaxes the gas shock and makes it much easier to do. Then you want to recreate, you know, their force traction in line so you're going to increase the deformity. So you're pulling, you know, out that way and, and you know, also pulling down and then you you're going to feel pop. So it's just going to come back to neutral. So this is, you know, something important to do quickly and so, and it's, and it's very easy. I generally, we have done it without giving conscious sedation. Okay, so moving on to foot. This woman feels a pop in her foot walking downstairs. Um, I, I think you probably can all see this at the base of the fifth. It's so important when you're looking at foot, and even on the ankle, on a good ankle film, they're going to always show you a picture that should include the base of the fifth metatarsal. So always look there. You know, anytime you see a transverse lucency going across the base, that is a fracture. If it's a vertical lucency, it can be an apophysis, especially in kids, but transverse is always abnormal. This, you know, this fracture is at the level, it's proximal to the tarso metatarsal joint. So this is, you know, um, considered a pseudo Jones or a dancer. It's not that serious. Basically, you can do anything with this. You can put a bandage on it, you can put him in a hard shoe, you can put him in walking, anything. It's all fine. It's all going to heal well. Um, okay. But you know, it's important, you know, they have the same mechanism as a lateral mal fracture of the ankle where you're gonna have an inversion injury. So when you're checking lateral mal, always check the base of the fifth metatarsal. Okay, and then here, this is same, you know, generally you'll see this repetitive like athletes, but this is a more distal injury. It's getting into the metathesis of the bone. Can you all see that there? Because that's that's a, a real Jones. You know, that's, some people call it a zone two, like a, the apophysis, the dancer fractures a zone one. Now you're getting zone two, there's not as good blood supply. They have a high rate of non-union. So this is something they really generally will be casted, though there's even questions raised about that. But it's important to distinguish between the two. Um, the Jones is less common, uh, non-union. Um, it's treated with a walking cast and, you know, the one thing which I always use, if, if, it, if the lucency is going towards the cuboid, that means it's a pseudo Jones. If it's actually going across towards the other metatarsal, that means it's a true Jones. So here, this is higher up. It's, going, it's not going to the cuboid down here. It's going into the fourth metatarsal. That's a, that's a Jones. That's much more concerning. This one's really heading down towards the cuboid. Okay, so that's, that's what I, how I you know, will use that. Okay. So moving on, this is 30-year-old. He has right foot pain. He's running and stepped into a hole. Anything strike you about this x-ray? I'll tell you it's his, the right foot. And I think that's the left, that's his left foot on the other side. What, what looks wrong here? And also, yeah, the classic mechanism for a Liz Frank is plantar flexion and external rotation, okay? So kids jumping off bunk beds will do this. You know, stepping in holes, you'll do this. Um, 
you know, in the classic, it's a, you know, you, there's a crease distance between, you know, between the first and the second metatarsal, though it can also be between the second and the third metatarsal, and it's a fractured dislocation um, involving the base of the second, oftentimes. Um, now, I'm just going to quickly go over these lines. Yeah, I, I think when you look at the foot, it's amazing bones. Know what the bones are. The first metatarsal should line up with the medial cuneiform, both sides of it. And then the second metatarsal, this is on an AP view, your medial aspect of your second metatarsal should line up with the medial aspect of the intermediate or second cuneiform. Okay, so I, I mean, I, I, I got to say, if you really want to learn a topic, give a lecture on it. There's, there, the, the Greeks say, you know, to teach is to learn twice. I say to teach is to learn it a hundred times because you realize all the holes in your knowledge. You really, you know, and so the fact I've had to go over this ten times to remember this. So I don't expect you guys to remember this, but you can look this stuff up. Um, and then, you know, on the oblique film, once again, there's certain lines, and on the, the oblique. The fourth metatarsal is going to line up with the cuboid, and then the third is going to line up with the lateral cuneiform. So these are certain lines. You know, sometimes you kind of get a look at this, you get a picture, a feeling for what it is. Um, but any time, we've had patients come in who have normal x ray findings but have great swelling of the foot. They're not able to walk, and we got a CT and they had a Liz Frank fracture. So Remember, x-rays are only going to pick up 75% of, of the Liz Frank. If you really are suspicious, if they're really swollen, they're tender midfoot, I would go to CT. And, and, and you can uh, make that diagnosis. Um, and even if they come from another institution, like my patient who had an a, a, a air conditioner fall on his foot, he went to Cornell, they told me he didn't have a fracture, he came to us. It's always worth doing another x-ray, not necessarily right, right moving on to CAT scan, um, because your x-ray may be done at a little bit different angle, and that little bit of a different angle may actually show what's going on. Um, but in our case, you know, we got a CT and actually found, found the fracture dislocation. This is oftentimes missed because it's not a common fracture, and they may also come in with low velocity injuries, so you may not be suspecting it. Um, this is the, the Liz Frank ligament. It goes from the you know, medial cuneiform to the second metatarsal. When that's ruptured, everything shifts over. And just remember these things. When you see ecchymosis on the bottom of the foot, that should key you in that this is a major foot injury that if you don't see something on the x-ray, go to CAT scan because this is a major finding for Liz Frank. And um, this is you know, another patient. On the AP view, everything lines up, but on the oblique, there's a step off over there. Okay, so you know it it does look a little wide, but you know those lines can help you there. Um, once again, here's four yell twist of the foot carrying furniture up the stairs. There's a step off between the second metatarsal and the um, intermediate um, cuneiform. Okay, so that remember just keep that stuff in your repertoire so you, you know you're aware of that. And, and also, the other thing on this, there's also a little chip over here. That chip's called the flex sign. Key, you see that? Make sure you think of a Liz Frank. Okay, so, you know, look for those lines, look for bruising on the bottom of the foot, foot and look for that flex sign. Those can all be subtle findings for a uh, Liz Frank fracture. Okay, you can get stress fuse if you don't see it, but I don't see how you're ever going to get the person to stand on that foot. So I would just go straight to CAT scan. And once again, you know, these, the sensitivity of x-rays for calcaneus, for Liz Frank is about, you know, can still miss a quarter. Midfoot fra fractures will miss a lot of them. What's the midfoot? It's all the cuneiforms, the um, navicular, and the cuboid. And j just quickly, you know, there's the Ottawa foot rules, which are very sensitive, but, and they've studied the foot rules. No one uses them, ankle rules, because no one can remember them. So this, <laughs> they came up with the 4455 6, 6 p.m. To, to see if people could better remember these things. You know, so the 4-4 four, four is that you're immediately able to take four steps and then, or, you know, if, um, or you're unable to take four steps in the ED. You know, and then five is um, there's pain at the fifth metatarsal, like we talked about, where you have the Jones fractures. And the five stands for an S, which is a scaphoid or an avicular. Uh, or six is looking at the posterior, the um, malleolus the lateral and medial mount. 
I don't know. I'm not sure if I can remember, but I may try and use it. Um, think about fractures that don't have immediate findings. Stress fractures. You know, so just because they have pain and you don't see anything, tell them you know there are certain things we may not be missing. Just like everything in medicine, you can never risk stratify down to zero. I mean, Amoma two is always saying this. You know that for cardiac pain, don't tell them they don't have anything. Just say that it seems unlikely because you can't tell them they don't have it because then they'll never come back. Let's say they do develop something, and even with these X-rays, there are a lot of things we can miss. So just keep that in your repertoire. Every time you do a CAT scan, know the things you can miss on CAT scan. Know the things you can miss on plain films. Stress fractures. You know especially if the pain's been going on for a while. You know, it may not show up for a month. Then, you know, toddler fractures also. You know, they, they are, you can miss them. They can very little findings, but if they're not walking on it, you know, keep that in your differential. And then, you know, remember, you know, um, like when you're looking, you know, air where it's not supposed to be, with this 85-year-old hypotensive, you know, let's say it's got an ulcer in the foot, you want to get an x-ray, see if there's any, um, you know, air, and you can feel if there's air crepitus or see anything on your um, x-ray. 